What time is that, Mike? Six bells, 11 p.m. In a few days, this honeymoon cruise will be just the memory. I could sneak up to the bridge and fiddle with the compass so we'll circle the Azores for a while. <laughs> and get locked up in the bilge? <laughs> you mean the brig? The bilge is... Where... Zod? Oh. Mars looks unusually red tonight. I hope it isn't an omen. Of course, being in the tropics, all the stars look brighter than they do at home. It seems to be getting bigger. Mm, it is getting bigger. Well, look, there's another one. To the right of the first. Well, there can't be two Marses. There are two. And another to the left, see? Glowing like red embers. There must be a flight of jets. And that's a cloud of luminous exhaust we're seeing. My God, they're heading this way. No, there are four. There are five now. Well, they're huge. They're gliding down across the ship's wake. Oh, the first one's diving into the water. Two more are going in. And you know how it can be with things of this nature, Mr. Watson. All sorts of fantastic stories make the rounds. Well, that's why I've come to see you, Captain Anderson. I'm a writer broadcaster on the staff of the EBC. And I'm sure they'd be interested in a piece on last night's incident. You mean BBC? Uh, no, sir. EBC. English Broadcasting Company. Oh. It was formed two years ago, sir. I see. Now... Every witness seems to have a different version, so I thought I'd check mine with your official one. Oh, here's the entry in my log. Thank you. Well, we seem to agree that there were five objects. Impossible to divine as to shape. They registered on the ship's radar screens. That's why they tentatively assumed it was being aircraft of an unknown type. What's your own private opinion, Captain? Did you ever see anything at all like them before? Uh, no. I never did, but... But what? Well, not for the record, Mr. Watson. I've heard of two instances, almost exactly similar, in the last year. For one time it was three of the things by night, the other it was half a dozen by daylight. Even so, they seem to have looked much the same, just a kind of red fuzz. Both lots were in the Pacific. You can't suggest an explanation I can quote. On professional grounds, I prefer not. I'll just stick to my official log entry. We searched the spot for an hour last night and not a trace of anything on the water. Is there any point in dragging? Oh, it's deep there. Over 3,000 fathoms. Well, somebody will put together a theory one day. You can be sure there'll be plenty of theories. Some strange things can still happen. Oh, you never realized what you'd started, Mike, when you broadcast your story about the fireballs. Look at this stack of mail. Over at EBC, I've been rechristened Fireball Watson. Mm. Well, did you find anything worthwhile in the letter? Five possibly have a reference to fireballs similar to those we saw from the ship. Uh, this letter's from uh, Flight Lieutenant RAF, who's been grounded because they think he suffered some kind of hallucination. These two letters are from observatories that confess themselves puzzled by detecting small red bodies traveling at high speeds. They're extremely guarded in their statements. What's the next step? Well, we'll keep on collecting and sifting as much information as we can get from any sort. Sooner or later. If we don't hurry, Mike, we'll never get seen. Now hang on, Phil. Look at this front page story. More fireballs. I'd almost forgotten about them. This is the first reported sighting in ten months. A flight of thirteen. A radar station in Finland picked them up first, estimating their speed as 1,500 miles per hour. What do they call them? They're described simply as unidentified aircraft. The Swedes managed to spot them visually, describing them as small red dots. Norway confirmed, but estimated the speed at under 1,300 miles per hour. It's time we made speed to the theater. Wait. Wait. This is interesting. A Scottish station logged the fireballs at 1,000 miles per hour. A station in Ireland gave their speed at 800. A weather ship at about 65 degrees north calculated a speed close to 500. After that, they were not sighted again. Presumably, they just plopped into the Atlantic. Oh, 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 o
Heavens, the way some people drive. Oh, Mike, you didn't even look before starting across. <laughs> if I were heavily insured and had been flattened by that jag, the color might have Your toast is getting cold, darling. Uh-huh. I used to be amused by cartoons showing husbands hidden behind a newspaper at the breakfast table. But Listen now... to this, Phil. The United States Navy took a crack at a flight of eight fireballs heading directly toward a cruiser when she was lying off Puerto Rico. The fireballs violated U.S. territory by crossing the island in a dead straight line and almost over the ship herself. What did they shoot at them with? Guided missiles. Through his glasses, the captain watched six of the red dots change as they burst, one after another, into big white puffs. And Washington has sent a note of protest to Moscow. You guessed it. Well, what's the Russian reaction? The Kremlin has rejected the U.S. note. It also claims that its own weapons have destroyed more than 20 of these unidentified craft over Soviet territory. Which bounces the ball right back across the court. Well, if the Russians have been blowing up fireballs... They say and... that, but no proof of it. Then what's their game? The fireballs don't appear to do anything. Well, at least nothing that anyone seems to know about. Must be an awfully expensive experiment. There have been hundreds of the things in the last couple of years. Yes, and every one a total write-off. <laughs> at least the fish can get a close look at them. <laughs> they might even awake the kraken. The what? The kraken. Don't you know that thing of Tennyson's? Below the thunders of the upper deep, far, far beneath in the abysmal sea, his ancient, dreamless, uninvaded sleep, the kraken sleepeth. <laughs> Well, if there is such a monster as the Kraken, I hope I never meet up with it. Heavens, look at the time. I have to charge down to the Admiralty. What's happening there? Freddie Whittier got a call the other day while I was on location. A Captain Winters said the Admiralty appreciated the snippets of information that EBC has been passing along to them on the fireball sightings. He suggested that since I'm more or less the EBC's expert on fireballs, I might be interested in examining what they've been able to put together. They're anxious to build up as complete a picture as possible. So we're going to... In here, Mr. Watson. So this is the map room, eh, Captain? Uh, one of several. <clears throat> now, I must explain that while what I'm going to show you is not exactly an official secret, the Admiralty prefers that you not make public use of it yet. Uh, do you agree to that condition? Mum's the word. Good. Well, I think we'll start with this map of the world. You see the hatching of fine lines all over it? Mm, looks like a spider's web. Well, each line is numbered and dated. And here and there, we have these clusters of red dots. Uh -huh. Now, hold this magnifying glass over the area southeast of the Azores. Mm. My first sighting, eh? Correct. There are quite a number of other red dots in that area. I take it each dot represents the descent of a fireball. One or more. The lines, of course, are only for those on which we've had good enough information to plot the course. Now, stand back a bit, Mr. Watson. Narrow your eyes and get a light and shade impression of the map. Yes, I see what you mean, Captain Winters. Areas of concentration. Five main ones and a number of lesser. The densest of the lot to the southwest of Cuba. Another 600 miles south of the Cocos Islands. And pretty heavy concentrations off the Philippines, Japan, and the Aleutians. Anything else strike you? No, I don't think so. Well, take a look at this bathymetric chart. All the concentrations are in deep water areas. Exactly. There aren't many reports of descents where the depth is less than 4,000 fathoms and none at all where it's less than 2,000. So, just what? Exactly. All descents. No reports of any fireballs coming up. Have you any idea at all what all this means? Well, as to theories, we have a number, but all unsatisfactory for one reason or another. What about the Russians? Oh, no, 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 no. It's nothing to do with them. <laughs> In fact, they're a lot more worried about it than we are. But what both we and the Russians are perfectly satisfied about is that these things are not natural phenomena. Nor are they random. The illustrious Sherlock Holmes used to say to my namesake, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Uh, yes. Which is to say that it's no terrestrial nation that's doing now, it. Now, that isn't the kind of solution I like. 
You know, the bottom of the sea would be a very good place for visitors from uh, outer space to hide. Could be if one could manage the technical difficulties. Well, undoubtedly, Mr. Watson, but among these technical difficulties happens to be pressure of four or five tons per square inch in the interesting areas. The other obvious question is, of course, what they seem to be doing. Yes. Meaning, no clue. They come. Maybe they go. But preponderantly, they come. That's uh, not all. Are you um, doing anything about it? Or shouldn't I ask? Oh, well, that's why you're here. Yes, I was coming around to that. We're going to try an inspection. Just at the moment, it's not considered to be a matter for direct broadcast, uh, not even for publication, but there ought to be a competent record of it. So, if your EBC people happen to feel interested enough to send you along with some recording gear... Well, where would it be? Well, approximately in this area of the Caribbean, southwest of Cuba. Mm. My wife has a passionate devotion to tropical sunshine, the West Indian kind in particular. Oh, by all means, bring her along. Yes, I understand she's an experienced script writer. Lieutenant Commander Powers will be in charge of the technical operations. Now, suppose we discuss the project with your director. Take off the top four ends now. Aye, aye, sir. It's just a big metal ball. Don't let Commander Powers hear you. That's his baby. Now, this instrument that you now see is what we call a bathyscope. <clears throat> the bathyscope has been constructed to resist a pressure approaching two tons to the square inch, giving it a theoretical floor of 1,500 fathoms. We do not propose to use it to a greater depth than 1,200 fathoms, just over 7,000 feet, thus providing for a safety factor of some 720 pounds to the square inch. Even at this, it will considerably surpass. That is the present limit of our ability to make direct visual observations. However, we have in this other metal sphere a new instrument with which we hope to make observations at something like twice the depth attainable by the bathyscope. It's entirely automatic. In addition to registering pressures, temperature, currents, and so on, and transmitting the readings to the surface, it is equipped with small television cameras. We plan to start the manned descent at sunrise. Two naval technicians, Petty Officers Wiseman and Trant, will be the bathyscope crew. As you all know, sunrise in the tropics comes right in the earth. Hello, bathyscope. All set to submerge. Okay, sir. Lower away now. Winch control. Lower away. Mm, I'd get claustrophobia squeezed into that tin can. Well, they couldn't have picked a better day. A breath of wind. Well, what happens now? Well, we all go up to the bridge and watch the television screen. It's been rigged up as a kind of control center. It's likely to take a while before they get down to the Probably no. Life in the sea exists in fairly well-defined levels. In the better inhabited strata, the water is full of plankton, which behaves like a continuous dust storm and obscures everything but creatures that approach very closely. The bathyscope is below those levels now, and in the strata where there is no plankton for food, and consequently, there are few fish. Hello, bathyscope. All in order below there? Aye, aye, sir. Half mile coming up. Check. Uh, 498... 499. Now, half mile, sir. 500 fathoms. Hmm. There's something out this way. Keeping on the edge of the lake. A big thing. I can't quite. Maybe a giant squid? No. It can't be a whale, not down here. Improbable, but not impossible. Well, in that case. Uh, He'll shear it off now, anyway. Well, from now on, it's all yours, lads. You sure you're quite happy down there? Everything's working fine, sir. We'll go on. All right. About 300 fathoms more to go. See anything now? Mm, no, sir. All black and dead now. Now we can see something below. 
luminous fish. Small show there. See? Yes, yes, we have them on the TV screen. Stopping you now, boys. Twelve hundred fathoms. Stop deck, winch. Well, whatever it was we came here to find, we've not found it. The echogram gives the bottom hereabouts a still three miles or so below where the batiscope has stopped. That's right. Hello there. Batiscope. We're going to start you up now. Ready? Okay, sir. All set. Hello, winch control. Fall away. Hello, batiscope. All okay? There's something out there. Something big. Can't see it properly. Have you got it on the TV screen up there? No, no, not yet. Probably because it keeps just on the fringe of the light. Can't be that way again, not at this step. I'll try and get a sharper focus on the camera for you. What's that lighter patch on the screen? Oh, hello, Bathesco. We have something on screen now, but it's very indistinct. Yes, seems to be circling now. I'll try and... Got a better glimpse of it then. It's not the whale. Anyway, there. See it? Eh? Yes. Something roughly oval, but still indistinct on the screen. Could be a big fish or maybe something else kind of turtle-shaped. Monstrous brute, anyway. Circling a bit closer now. Can you make out any detail yet? No. Just the overall shape. It's keeping pace with us. Hello, Batiscope. Target has just got off the screen. It's going up now, rising faster than we are. Getting beyond our angle of view. Ought to be wind on the top of this thing. <sighs> Lost it now. Gone somewhere up above us. Maybe. Hello, Batiscope. Do you read me? Hello, Batiscope. Why is the deck winch running so fast? Because there's nothing at the end of the cable. We've lost the battle Found the emergency signal. Good script, Mrs. Watson. Thank you, Captain. Well, nevertheless, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to hold it up for a while. My wife tried to make it a tribute to the two men who lost their lives in the battle school. Well, I know, and I'm sorry. But I did warn you that the story wouldn't be for immediate release. May I ask why, Captain Winters? The crux of the thing is those fused cables. Imagination staggers a bit at the thought of a creature capable of snapping through a steel hawser. Not just one cable. The same thing happened the next day to the unmanned probe that Commander Powers sent down. And to the third on the following day. Yes, when I examined the ends of the wire ropes, I had expected to see them unraveled, splayed out, brush-like. But they were melted together. Both the main and the communications cables ended in a blob of fused metal. This brings us smack up against the possibility that there's a creature capable of cutting through them like an oxyacetylene flame. The mind rejects that suggestion. However, a thing like that is not just a hazard of deep sea diving. And we want to know more about just what kind of a hazard it is before we give out a release on it. But I assure you that you'll be notified of release at the earliest possible moment. Well, I guess that's that. I'm afraid so. Honestly, Captain Winters, and off the record if you like, have you any idea what can have done it? On or off the record, Mrs. Watson, I can think of no explanation that approaches being possible. And I doubt whether anyone else in the service has an idea. For oh, goodness sake, Mike, when are you going to stop dropping cigarette ashes on the new carpet? Oh, don't worry about it, darling. Cigarette ash keeps out moths. <laughs> oh, it's about time for the EVC news, isn't it? Oh, it's started by now. Details not immediately available. According to the bulletin issued from Washington less than an hour ago, an American naval unit conducting research into deep sea conditions somewhere off the Philippines has suffered the loss of a depth chamber. 
Closer to home, a Russian trawler narrowly missed a collision with the Canadian submarine Qualicum, currently engaged in maneuvers with the Royal Navy northeast of Iceland. And now a look at the weather. Tonight will be clear Wouldn't you know it? The American story will be spread all over the front pages by tomorrow morning. Why should it be? All the public knows is that an American diving bell has been lost. The U.S. Navy could say that the cable was defective. No, I, I very much doubt that anyone who doesn't know would suspect a link between deep-sea diving accidents and the topic of mysterious fireballs, which in any case are old hat now. Mm, you're probably right, Phil. Well, Captain Winters might be able to find out if the Americans were on the same kind of project that we covered. If he pulls some strings, maybe we could compare notes with whoever was covering it. Between the Royal Navy and the EBC, we ought to be able to scratch up something. Mm -hmm. Then we'll have to be up bright and early tomorrow morning. I don't mind telling you, Mrs. Watson, it took some strategic maneuver to get Commander Shaw over here. You can say that again, Captain Winters. Every NATO intelligence organization wants to pump me. But since you people had the same sort of experience in the Caribbean, the British Navy got priority. Well, as I explained earlier, Commander, the Watsons have been very closely associated from the outset with the research on this phenomenon. Uh -huh. And you're aware, of course, that no details of our own catastrophe have leaked out. Uh, apart from the loss of the bathyscope at its crew. No mention of the fused cables? Not one. Oh, well, here's the story. We were using an automatic instrument, uh, pretty much like the one you people lost. The idea was to send that down first. And if it came up again okay, then we'd take another crack at it with a manned depth chamber. We had two ships. One was the research vessel Dolphin with the depth chambers and gear. We used another ship as an observation platform. Because there was so much stuff aboard the Dolphin, we would have been falling over each other. We had microwave between the ships so we could watch on our screens just as well as they could on theirs. But it was a pretty boring show. By two and a half miles down, I was out on deck having a smoke. Suddenly, there was a yell from inside the saloon. I had my back to the research ship. A moment before, she'd been lying there like a duck asleep on a pond. Well, I, I don't know what kind of thunderstorms you folks have over here, but in some places they have a kind where the lightning looks like it's running around all over a building. And that was the way the research ship looked just then. And then she blew up. But the news bulletin said a diving chamber had been lost. Not the entire ship. That's right, ma'am. And don't ask me why they're keeping the lid on the full story. Anyway, when the dolphin blew up, we all of us hit the deck in a split second. And then there was spray and scrap coming down all over. When we could look again, there wasn't anything there but a lot of water getting itself smoothed up. Did you collect any debris to study? Well, there wasn't much to pick up. A few bits of wood, half a dozen life boys, and three bodies all badly burnt. We collected what there was and returned to the base. Do you know what caused the explosion? Well, I, I'm told it isn't possible to persuade a high charge, say a few million volts, to run up an uninsulated hawser in seawater. So I've got to accept that. But all I say is that if it were possible, then I guess the effect might be quite a bit like what we saw. It looked to me like it followed the main hawser. <laughs> but the physics boys won't buy that. They have no alternative suggestion? Oh, sure. Several. Some of them could sound quite convincing to a fellow who hadn't seen it happen. Anyway, the physics boys are still baffled by those fused cables of yours because whatever happened to the dolphin, those cable severances on the British gear couldn't have been accidental. Oh, uh, incidentally... We've got a couple more probes lined up. But no publicity, please. Where are they being done? One off the Aleutians, the other in a deep spot in the Guatemala Basin. If you look at this map, Mrs. Watson, you can see that those two particular areas have had a comparatively large. driving rather fast, Mike. Look who's talking. At least I drive carefully. Oh. Now, you know perfectly well a lorry backed into the car when I was at the hairdressers, and then it just drove off. Oh, the phantom bumper basher. 
Maybe I could do a little piece on the subject for Freddy's This and That program. <laughs> Things are a bit slack just now. Yes, very little's happened since the bathyscope story was released two months ago. Well, there was nothing little about the flood of letters that came in. But nothing of any value. Imagine the mountains of mail the Americans had to cope with when the loss of the dolphin was made public. I wonder how Commander Shaw managed. He's aboard the probe ship off Guatemala. How do you know he is? Winters mentioned it last week when we were checking news reports. Well, speaking of news... A majority of the opposition members objected that the minister's reply to the House was an obvious evasion of responsibility by the government. Here is a news bulletin. The United Press dispatch from Washington states that the United States Navy has reported the loss of another deep-sea research ship. The USN Barracuda was operating south of the Aleutians when radio transmission cut out suddenly. The ship is reported sunk with all hands. Search aircraft spotted wreckage which suggested that some kind of explosion might have occurred. Commander Shaw is lucky. In France, another student demonstration tangled traffic for several blocks in... There's simply got to be an explanation. Ships just don't blow up without a reason. When and if we do discover the reason, maybe we'll wish we'd never got involved in this strange business. There's something very, very evil about it. Time to get up, Mike. Yes, eh? Mike, wake up, darling. Here, look. Take a look at the front page of this newspaper. What's happened? Well, the Americans have lost the destroyer off the Philippines. A destroyer? That's the sixth ship in less than three months. Six down. How many more to go, I wonder? Turn to page five. You'll find that the Americans lost their patience along with that destroyer. They're going to use atomic bombs. Do you suppose we might be able to get Captain Winters to do some wang? No. Winters has a certain amount of influence, but the atomic bomb thing is an American show. Well, it was a thought. You'd better shave now while I get breakfast. All the same, give Captain Winters a call, just in case you know something. Now for the wine. Do you have any preference, Mrs. Watson? Oh, I know as much about wines, Mr. Mallaby, as I do about cars. Oh, that reminds me, Phil. Oh, you know... please, Mike, not in front of such illustrious company. Illustrious? <laughs> Mallaby and me? We're just a couple of hard-working journalists. You're too modest, Mr. Bunnell. <laughs> Phyllis has been in a spin for the last couple of days at the prospect of dining with John Mallaby of the Tidings and Stuart Bunnell of the Sentinel. You flatter us. Now, what do you say to Chateau Margot? 1962. Excellent. John, you'd started to say something about it being necessary to postulate an intelligence responsible for the fireballs and such. Yes, Stuart. It's been the reluctance to postulate an intelligence that's been the chief stumbling block. I'm no Bocker champion, but however we feel about his theory, Bocker does tie in more factors than anyone else. Uh, excuse the interruption. But the introduction of this Bocker element has me all at sea. Oh, sorry. We took it for granted that the name of Alistair Bocker was not entirely unknown to you. Oh, it's not unknown, being such an eminent geographer. We didn't know that Dr. Bocker had come up with a theory to account for the fireballs and the sinkings. It was presented to the Admiralty at least a year ago. Captain Winters never so much as mentioned it. Quite likely he never got to see it. Because Bocker is Bocker, the memorandum succeeded in getting itself read at some quite important levels. Well, that's as far as it went. Now, the gist of Dr. Bocker's argument was that the fused cables and electrification of certain ships must be regarded as indisputable evidence of intelligence at work in certain deeper parts of the oceans. He also insisted that because of the extreme conditions of the environment, no intelligent form of life could have evolved several thousand feet down. At the same time, Bocker said we must assume that no nation is capable of constructing mechanisms that could operate at such depths in so many places. So whatever it is, it must have evolved somewhere else. Yes. Let's say on a large planet where the pressures were normally very high. They selected Jupiter as being most likely to fulfill the conditions of pressure. <laughs> Imagine the splash that would have made in the pages of the tidings in the center. Uh, that's just what I thought. You see... 
When Bocker got nowhere with their lordships at the Admiralty, he withdrew his memorandum and presented it for the personal consideration of William Harding, my managing editor. Harding tactfully returned it with a polite note. The editor of the Sentinel did the same. Much too sensational. I wonder why the Daily Tape or the Lens hasn't printed it. Well, isn't it just their stuff? Oh, what about the American tabloids? The Tape very nearly did publish it. Only Dr. Bocker said he'd sue them if they mentioned his name. He's after reputable publication or none at all. One small American paper did use a chewed up version, but as this was their third interplanetary invasion story in four months, it made no impact. Well, whatever the top naval men may think about Dr. Bocker, it seems clear enough that they must have been assuming for some time that there is something intelligent down in the depths. Why do you say that, Mike? Because you don't build a special underwater atomic bomb in a few days. But is it really too late? For some such friendly approach as Dr. Bocker wanted, I mean. Mm. Well, there's only been one bomb exploded. If there isn't another, the uh, things down there might think it was a natural disaster, a, a volcanic eruption or something. It won't be just one bomb. And it was always too late, my dear. Can you imagine us tolerating any form of rival intelligence on Earth, no matter how it got here? Why, we can't even tolerate anything but the narrowest differences of views within our own race. I'd like to interview Alastair Bocker one day. He could fill in a good many pieces of the puzzle. You know, Mike, things sort of die on us. When all that excitement about the fireballs boiled up, it looked as if we were right at the middle of the story of the century. <laughs> now that's all fizzled out. Everything's gone quiet again. If you'd read the papers properly, you'd see that two more atomic bombs were sent down in the last week. One in the Caucasus Keeling Basin, the other in the Prince Edward Island Deep. I didn't see that. With news value practically nil at the moment. You have to read the small print. It does show that they've not shelved the whole thing. The Navy, I mean. Apparently not. Oh, is that why you arranged the luncheon date for me with Captain Winters? <laughs> I'm to play the Matahari game, am I? Well, only up to a point, my Jo. Dear, the way I have to work. One day you'll find it's misfired and you've cut yourself out. <laughs> Darling, you know you thoroughly enjoy yourself. Well, the captain's a very attractive man. It was such a lovely little out-of-the-way place. The Dover Soul was marvellous and their cheese is a scrumptious. What did Captain Winters have to say? Oh, lots of nice things. <laughs> But passing from the really important to matters of more worldwide interest. <laughs> well, the General Flaff seems to have worried the authorities. It's unsettled people. The brass is uneasy that what is just an excitement now might suddenly turn into a large-scale panic. Have their investigations made any more progress? Captain Winters didn't actually say they hadn't, but what he said implied it. Hmm. What about the atomic bombs? Mm, he says they're out. Well, for the moment, at any rate. Why? Well, you can only use them in isolated places. And even then, the radioactivity spreads widely. They kill an awful lot of fish and make a lot more radioactive. Fisheries experts on both sides of the Atlantic have been complaining. Ah. Everything you said we already knew, more or less. Well, here's something that you didn't know. Two of those special atomic bombs haven't gone off. Oh? And it has them very worried. Wait, you see... The way they're set to operate is by the pressure at a given depth. Simple and pretty accurate. There's also a secondary setting on the bombs, quite independent of the pressure switch. It's a precaution, just in case the bomb happens to land on a submarine mountain or something. Well, it works with a time switch. Only with these two bombs, it hasn't worked. Perfectly simple, my dear Watson. The water got in and stopped the clock. There's nothing simple about it, Mike. And it's made them extremely anxious. Three cable repair ships have unaccountably disappeared. Any survivors? No. Now they're developing some kind of guided depth missile which will be high explosive, not atomic. She hasn't been tested yet. Oh, incidentally, Captain Winters promised me an introduction to Dr. Louis Matte, the oceanographer. But the Oceanographical Society has more or less threatened to excommunicate anybody who deals with us after that last script. It's part of their anti bocker line. This Dr. Matte happens to be a friend of the captain's. He's seen the fireball incidence maps, and he's a half-convert. When can we see him? 
I hope to see him in a few days' time. But don't you think I no. should? No. But it's sweet of you not to trust me still. Uh, but still. No. Now it's time you went to work on the dishes. I still think it would be a good idea if I were to go along when you see him. What a lovely garden, Dr. Matter. <laughs> it must be inspiring to work in such attractive surroundings. Well, we located this branch of the Institute here because of the many highly sensitive instruments we have. <laughs> to be well away, that is, from vibrations caused by traffic, jet aircraft, and so on. Oh, oh, these are gorgeous roses. Oh, you must take some home with you, Mrs. Oh, Watson. No, I wouldn't dream oh, of I it. insist. But, do you mind if we sit on this bench in the sun? By all means. I love the sun. Mm, so do I. Well, now, to get back to our topic. Uh, uh, before I comment any further, I, I, I must make it quite clear to you that any material I might supply must remain strictly anonymous in origin. Agreed? Of course. Now, would you repeat what you had started to say about reports of discolorations in certain ocean currents? Oh, yes, the uh, discolorations... Well, the first observation was made a year ago in the Kurosiba current in the North Pacific. What kind of discolorations? An unusual muddiness flowing um, northeast. The samples were taken and sent for examination. And what do you think the discoloration turned out to be? <laughs> I wouldn't even attempt to guess. Mainly radiolarian ooze, but an appreciable percentage of diatomaceous ooze. Oh, obviously, Dr. Merte, something not only was, but still is going on down there. Something definitely is. Uh, but to be honest with you, Lord knows what it is. Uh, what's more, the same thing is happening in other areas of the oceans. Do you think it's serious? I mean, is it something that worries you? Well, it doesn't keep me awake at night, if that's what you mean. Our worry is that we don't like having to admit that we are baffled in our own, uh, how do you say, uh, bailiwick. As for its effect, well, I, I think that might be beneficial. In what way? There's a great deal of uh, nutritious ooze lying wasted on the sea bottom. The more of it that comes up, the more the plankton will thrive. And the more the plankton thrives, the more the fish will thrive. Uh, consequently, the price of fish ought to go down, <laughs> which would be very nice for those who like fish, <laughs> uh, of which I am not one. <laughs> uh, what troubles me is that I feel I ought to be able to answer a simple why on the matter. After all, I'm supposed to have been an expert for a number of years now. So my head was spinning. Well, all in all, Mike, too much geography and too much bathyography and too much of all the ographies. I'm lucky to escape ichthyology. Dr. Matte doesn't like fish. Well, I'd like to see anybody make a script out of that lot of notes. Hmm. Well, there's no hmm about it. Some kind of ographer might give a talk on it to highbrows, but... Even if he was intelligible, where would it get anybody? Dr. Merte didn't suggest how this sediment bit might link in with the fireballs and the rest. No. No, he admitted he doesn't know. But he isn't going to make any guesses that might send his reputation the way Dr. Bocker's has gone. Bocker must have some views on this. And it might be worth trying to find out what they are. That select press conference of his that we went to was almost an introduction. Well, he went very coy after that. Well, not surprising, really. Still, we weren't among the ones who panned him publicly. Uh, toss you. Which of us rings him up? Mm, I'll do it. The fact that I've just interviewed Dr. Matte might make it a bit easier to persuade him. Well, as I explained when I telephoned you, Dr. Barker, what we're trying to do is to fit a lot of bits and pieces into a puzzle. Yeah. Well, if you can show us where one of them should go, we'd be very grateful. Well, you, uh, you you both know my theory of the origin of this deep water intelligence, so we'll not go into that now. We'll, uh, we'll deal with the present state of affairs, and I deduce it to be this. Having settled into the environment best suited to them, these creatures' next thought would be to develop that environment in accordance with their ideas of what constitutes a convenient, 
orderly and eventually civilized condition. May I ask how you arrived at that conclusion? You see, because they are pioneers, colonists. Ah. Once they have safely arrived, they set about improving and exploiting their new territory. What we've been seeing are the results of their having started work on the job. What sort of work, Doctor? Well, how can we possibly tell? But judging by the reception they received from us, uh, guided missiles and uh, atomic bombs, one would imagine that their first concern would be to provide themselves with some form of defense. For this, they would require metals. I, I suggest, therefore, that somewhere down in the Mindanao Deep, and also somewhere in the deep in the southeast of the uh, Kokos Keeling Basin, you will find mining operations now in progress. I know of nothing, and, and can imagine nothing, that could produce the effect we've observed, except some exceedingly powerful machine for continuous ejection of debris. What about the other places? Well, I suspect from their locations that they may have another purpose. Which is? Communications, I think. So, on this map, you can see the Romance Trench in the uh, equatorial Atlantic. And? It, it, it goes uh, through the submerged mountains of the Atlantic Ridge. Uh -huh. Now, when one considers the fact that this trench forms the only deep link between the eastern and western Atlantic basins, it seems more than just a coincidence that signs of activity should show up there. And the activity strongly suggests to me that something down below is not satisfied with the natural state of the Romance Trench. If there were prospects of using it, it would be an advantage to clear the trench of ooze deposits down to a solid bottom. Now, does it not strike you that for a creature of the depths, a tunnel connecting the deeps on either side of the isthmus would offer advantages almost identical with those that we obtained from the existence of the uh, Panama Canal? Those are fascinating theories, Dr. Bocker. You've given us plenty of food for thought. <laughs> yes, but not indigestible, I hope. <laughs> well, since, since you're following this along, you've probably heard of two atomic bombs that failed to go off. Yes, we have. Have you heard that there was an uh, unsponsored atomic explosion yesterday? Was it one of them? Well, I hate to think it could be any other atomic bomb. But the odd thing is that Though one bomb was lost off the Aleutians and the other in the Mindanao Deep, yesterday's explosion took place off Guam. But that's miles away. Yes, a good 1,200 miles away. It's incredible. You see, I'm not the alarmist type, and I, I wouldn't want to feel that I was contributing to the current uneasiness in official circles. However, I'm perturbed by a, a certain ominousness in the speed with which our unidentified visitors took up the defensive. As if they might have expected something of the kind and prepared for it. Then what would you propose as the next stage? What really remains to be seen is whether the natural obstacles that now separate us will defeat their abilities, as they almost defeat ours. And, and if they do not, then how can we meet them when they come? You really believe we might have to fight them? Given two intelligent species with differing requirements on one planet, it's, it's inevitable that sooner or later one will exterminate the other. That has a very grim Darwinian sound. Hmm? Yeah. You said inevitable. Do you really think that? Well, we can't both inherit the Earth. Have you developed any theories on how we can defend our um, civilization? No. No, I, I, I expect that the weapons to be chosen will be dictated largely by the time, place, and nature of the need. And if I seem pessimistic, it's because my belief in the essential good nature of my fellow men. I shall be ever respectful to the memory of your late Aunt Harriet. Mm. Without that little legacy, we could never have afforded the cottage. Mm. A place in Cornwall has always been a dream of mine. Now, whenever we get enough assignments lined up, we can nip down here and write and take long walks along the shore. And drink rough cider in the smuggler's roost. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, I think you had rather a lot last night. Oh. I'm surprised your head doesn't hurt. Well, this sea breeze clears away the cobwebs. <laughs> oh, did you bring along the newspaper with the story about the Japanese uh, ship? I slipped the front page into my pocket. Well, at least there were survivors. 
We might find out something. Only five for more than 700 on board. Mike? You see this little map of the area where the Yatoshiro went down? Yes. The spot marked X? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, doesn't that put the scene of this sinking near the Mindanao Trench? It can't be far off. Fair weather, no collision, no explosions. How the devil does a 19,000-ton ship suddenly sink like a steel coffin? Someone has suggested metal fatigue as the possible cause. Do you think this can be it, Mike? So soon? It's difficult to tell. So much of this newspaper story is dramatized. If it actually sank in only a minute... No, I suspend judgment, Phil. We'll see what tomorrow's Times has to say. When I sit here by the sea, the rest of the world seems a million miles away. And there are times when I find myself wishing that... the right place. I was just telling Harold it couldn't be because Phyllis did say it was called Rose Cottage. And, well, where are the roses, Mike? <laughs> I'm sorry, Junie. We should really have to grow some. Well, let's go in. Phil has the kettle on. If the weather holds, we should be able to manage it with a bit of a walk. Well, oh, do have some more ham, Harold. I won't say no, Phil. It's excellent. Mm, good. By the way, how is the metal fatigue theory going down with your engineering firm? No, it's not pleasing our people. I didn't think it would. Help yourself to the salad. Thank you. Metal fatigue? Oh, oh, you don't mean to say that people here really believe all that stuff about metal fatigue causing that Japanese liner to break up and sing? Well, why not, Tune? There's nothing very new about the idea of metal fatigue. And it's practically official now. Oh, Mike, surely you don't believe official statements anymore? Of course they had to make some kind of statement or else do something about it. Well, it's pretty much like Munich and so many other flim flams. Oh, come, Junior, I'd not go so far as that. Well, near enough. If they can do it once and have the whole thing explained away for them, they'll just be encouraged to do it again and go on doing it. We ought to have called their bluff months ago. Whose bluff? Oh, you know what I mean, Mike. All this story about things in the sea and those fireball things and all that silly stuff about Martians and so on. I don't recall anything about Martians. Well, Neptunians, it's the same sort of thing. Or the rubbish that Dr. Bocker put about. I can't think why he wasn't arrested long ago. Nowadays, we don't arrest people for suggesting scientific theories. Well, I happen to know from somebody who used to know him that Bocker joined the Communist Party when he first went up to the university. And, of course, he's been working for them ever since. No, chill me. Well, he, he didn't invent it. I don't mean that. No, the whole thing was thought up in Moscow. And they just used him to put it across because he was influential. And he did it very well. That story about the things in the sea was all over the world. And a lot of people believed in it for a bit. But, of course, Barker is done for now. Of course, that doesn't matter to them. They do that to people. He was just wanted to lay a foundation, you see. Are you saying the whole thing has been engineered by the Russians right from the beginning? Well, of course. Quite a long time ago now, they had their first try with the flying saucers. But that didn't come off because most people didn't believe in them. So this time they improved it. First, they sent out the red balloon things to puzzle people. Then there was all this business about things down on the sea bottom that Dr. Barker helped to spread. And to make that more convincing, they cut some cables and even sank a few ships. Uh, what with? Well, with these new midget submarines of theirs. The same kind that they used on this Japanese ship. And now they'll just be able to go on sinking ships because once people have seen through this metal fatigue business, they'll just say it's being done by the what's it's in the sea and as long as people believe that, there'll be no popular backing for reprisals against the Russians. So the metal fatigue idea was just to keep people quiet. Exactly, Phyllis. The government doesn't dare admit that it's the Russians, because then there would be a demand that they should take action. And they can't afford to do that with all the red influence there is in the world today. But if they officially pretend to think it's these Bocker things, well, then they'd have to pretend that they were doing something about that as well. And that would make them look pretty silly later on when it's all exploded. <clears throat> One of these days, I'm likely to discover that my wife's employed by the Secret Service. Oh, Harold, as a public relations man, it should be easy for you to see that what I am saying is simply down-to-earth logic. And this is the government's way out of a sticky dilemma. Obviously. And as it's only a Japanese ship that's been sunk, it's all right. 
for the moment. But it won't last long. We can't afford to have the Russians getting away with this kind of thing. I think Tuni lays it on a bit thick. But I can see a busy time ahead for me. Months of writing stuff to prove that none of our products can possibly suffer from metal fatigue. Well, what's it matter, Harold? They'll have to use your product. Oh, I know that, but all our competitors will be saying how their goods aren't affected by it. So it'll look bad if we don't do the same. Also, you notice the shipping shares? Yes, sinking lower every day. That isn't good, Mike. It points to a number of people who aren't satisfied with the metal fatigue or the Russians as explanations. Well, are you? Oh, of course not. Well, that isn't the point. I'm not the kind of fellow who can make a difference to the price of shipping shares. The ones who can are influential. If they start a scare, people start cancelling orders and trade bogs down. Oh, it doesn't matter a hoot whether there are things at the bottom of the sea or not. What does matter is that if people swing back to thinking there are, if they do, we'll have one hell of a trade recession. Well, if you do happen to have any money in shipping, Harold, I should take it out and put it into aircraft shares. Hmm. I know you and Phil have been specializing in this thing and following it along. Have you any solution? No, I'm afraid we don't. Oh. Oh, we're just in time to catch the news broadcast. I'll turn it on. In a very brief statement issued by the Home Secretary that the ship had been lost at sea about three hours ago. No details are available as yet, but it is feared that the list of the missing may prove to be very heavy. A modern vessel of 90,000 tons, the Queen Anne was the current holder of the transatlantic record. Several ships are racing to the spot where the sinking occurred in the hope of picking up survivors. I'm sorry. I couldn't take any more. Oh, that lovely ship. And you think Martians did that? One moment, please. Mike? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mike, wake up. Long distance for you. What at this ungodly hour? It's none other than the EBC's director of talks, dear old Freddie Whittier. Hmm. <clears throat> Hello? Hello? I'm afraid you might be out, Mike. At 5 a.m. Well, you've heard the news about the Queen Anne sinking. Yes, of course. Uh, we want something from you on this deep sea menace. The last thing I was told was to lay off any hint well, this of... This disaster has changed all that. Don't be too sensational, of course. Be convincing. Make them believe there is something down on the sea bottom. Uh, what's the reason for doing it now, Freddy? Well, there's a rumor running wild here that the Russians sank the Queen Anne. You know how it is when people get emotionally worked up. And if it isn't stopped, there might be serious trouble for the government. Well, that kind of rumor is easier to start than stop. Stopped it's got to be. Metal fatigue isn't good enough this time. So the line is to be the deep sea menace. Tomorrow's papers are using it. The Admiralty is willing to play, and we've got several big scientific names already. Well, that should help some. There's more. The BBC's next bulletin and ours will have strong hints to start the ball rolling. The big American networks have started already. Okay, Freddy, I'll get cracking right away. A half-hour feature. What angle? Serious, but not blood-curdling. Not too technical, intelligent man-in-the-street stuff. Communicate cautious but confident optimism. Well, I'll do my best. And I'll telephone you as soon as Phyllis and I have been able to put something together. Darling, where did you put the atlas? Um, it's under that pile of newspaper clippings on the floor. <sighs> you know, Mike, I've been thinking that the first thing people are going to ask is, if this menace is so serious, why has nothing been done? Well, that needn't be too difficult to handle. We can use the unpreparedness angle as a diversionary challenge. The brains of the world getting together and turning the full force of modern science on the job of avenging human lives and ships and preventing any more. Hmm. Um, uh, carry on while I ransack the files. Not so fast, darling. That's the fourth gin and lime you've knocked back in three hours. Well, haven't we earned the right to relax a bit? <laughs> You're liable to relax so much I'll have to carry you out of the pump. <laughs> well, it's a lovely way to research the results of a propaganda project. Do you think the newspaper stories and broadcasts about the deep sea menace have done the trick? Well, our survey has been limited to the pubs and farmers, but 
I'd say the rumor of the Russians being responsible for sinking the Queen Anne was fading fast. I little doubt it would have swept the field if the papers the next morning hadn't pinned the responsibility on the things down below. Is the fact likely to be fully accepted? With so many prominent people taking a serious view of the situation, it's not as easy to scoff at now. Mm. Why so quiet all of a sudden? News time. Derek Cook, bringing you the English Broadcasting Company's 11 o'clock edition of news from at home and around the world. The General Assembly of the United Nations today discussed the global problem presented by the occupation of many deep sea areas by as yet unidentified alien forces. The President of the Assembly asked all member nations to treat the situation with the utmost gravity. He stated that with strength, determination, and universal cooperation... Stand by, please. The regular news broadcast will continue in a moment following this special bulletin. Two more ships are reported sunk. The new British aircraft carrier Meritorious and the American luxury cruise ship Carey Princess. The Meritorious went down in mid-Atlantic, 800 miles southwest of the Cape Verde Islands, the Carey Princess in the area of the Puerto Rico Trench. Both ships sank in a matter of two or three minutes, and from each, very few survived. The EBC will interrupt regular programming as new information becomes available. And now we return to the regular news items prepared for this broadcast. Two in one day. Oh, it's like a horrible nightmare. It's likely to get worse before it gets better. Let's take stock of people's reactions. Yes. All right, Jack. Say there are these what fits at the bottom of the sea. Then what A want to know is why we're not getting off them right away. We've got atom bombs and hydrogen bombs and who knows what other kinds, haven't we? Well, why don't we go out to bomb them to hell? Okay, Ted. But if you go and bomb them to hell... They you know kept what? on talking about the deeps. Then why don't we get cracking and suck the deeps good and hard? I'll tell you why, chum. It's because the old thing's a lot of bloody eyewash. What do you mean? They wash things in the bloody deeps. Horse marines and bloody martins. Now look, tell me this. We lose ships. The Yanks lose ships. The Jets lose ships. All right. But do the Russians lose ships? Do they hell? And I'd like to know why not. The Russians did lose a ship. When was that, Mom? Well, the way back at the time when the American cruiser sank off the Marianas. A Russian ship went down eastward as a courier. Lady, you, either you've got a fantastic memory or She I works for the news clipping service. Oh. That kind of work sharpens one's memory for details. All right. So she read it in a newspaper years back. That's just the kind of camouflage you could expect from the commies. No, Jack. If it was the Russians, the Yanks would have pressed the button before an arrow. Oh. Moscow would be nothing but a big hole in the ground. My kids will think I'm off my bloody rock if I let on I believe this creepy crawlies on the sea bottom planning to take over the world from us. What next? Ah, you've got to plan for it. Make anything else, I suppose. They must say it make me feel easier to know somebody was really doing something about it. That's a bloody trouble with our government. Nobody tries to do anything till it's too bloody like the matter is this, Mike. I've had on good authority, though strictly off the record, that the Americans decided to depth bomb the trench at the point where the Carib princess vanished, primarily as a gesture in response to public opinion. They don't think it'll do a bit of good, but they have to make a show of some sort. The project certainly has been well publicized. Yes, it has, Phyllis. American citizens now feel proud that their forces are taking a lead in reprisals. The British seem to have decided to applaud the occasion as a gesture of reproof to their own leaders. Why couldn't you have let Phil and me do some of the on-scene reportage, Freddy? Oh, why waste your time and experience on some fruitless gesture designed for publicity purposes? We can sit right here in the studio and listen to Derek doing his bit for dear old EBC. He's been nagging me for nearly a year to let him have a roving assignment. Well, you'll find it a lot less cut and dry than rattling off newscasts. <laughs> well, I hope you remember to carry some pills for seasickness. <laughs> well, let's see how the shortwave pickup is behaving now. Could you give us the feed, please? A truly beautiful day here, with the sea sparkling like diamonds. Oh, yeah. Every now and then, schools of flying fish burst from the waves and glide over the water like jeweled insects. 
The flotilla, ten ships commissioned for this important task, set out from Chesapeake Bay amid a tremendous standoff. Admiral Rockwell Hagen, known in the United States Navy as Old Rock Bottom, <laughs> confidently expects the mission to be a success. Amid the general acclamation for the Armada, the voice of Cuba has been heard protesting at the prospect of atomic bombs on her doorstep. Stand by, please. Derek seems to be enjoying himself. The flagship mm. has just signaled battle station. Oh, here we go. You can feel a wave of uh, tension sweeping over the entire ship now. Stand by. We're only a short distance now from the target area. In fact, at this moment, the flotilla is over the Cayman Trench, a huge trough-like depression in the sea bottom. The ship's are reducing speed now. The moment is approaching. In addition to two atomic bombs, the expedition's armed with a number of high-explosive bombs designed for great depths. I've been told by the technical experts that when these bombs are... Yes, Oh, no. She's gone. The ship's disappeared. Nothing but snow and... Oh, oh. That explosion you heard, that explosion you heard, the first one, was the, the destroyer for boats. She's in, entirely disappeared. The second explosion was the frigate Redwood. We oh, took on to Redwood. Carried one of the atomic bombs, but it didn't go off. It's designed to operate by water pressure at five miles depth. The remaining ships are dispersing at full speed to get away from the danger area. We do have a few minutes to get there. I don't know how long. But we here can, can say every ship choosing every ounce of power to get away from the atomic bomb before it goes off. They're going uh, flat out, deck shuddering under us. They will make it, maybe. Faster now. Faster. Come on. And I now, since the Redwood tank must be beyond the main spout area by now. Let's have a chance. Everybody looking astern. Watching. Waiting for it. All this time that bomb's been sinking. Sinking. Nothing's happened yet. Must be getting clear of the worst now. We must have a chance. Yes, I... I do think we've really got the chance now. There is a lighting cigarette, so the hands are a bit shaky, but I can sense the tension easing. It's gone. Oh, no. Poor old Derek. His wife had a baby only last month. This one's going to take a lot of explaining away. Some publicity gesture, eh, Freddy? Any minute now, all hell will break loose. Telephones will start jangling and people will be demanding to know. You're late, Phil. I ordered a sherry for you. Oh, Mike, you ought to see Oxford Street. <laughs> Talk about panic buying. Everything's gone completely mad since the government suddenly introduced rationing for essential goods and services. But most food prices have doubled already. I don't know where it's likely to end. Well, let's enjoy our meal before this place changes its menu prices. <laughs> Stanley Roberts says the bottom has dropped out of the shipping market and the airlines have had to apply priority schedules. Think of all the stranded tourists who've cancelled their sea passages. Oh, by the way, Freddie says Derek Cook will be back on the job soon. Oh, good. A bit radioactive, but five of the ten ships made it back safely. Oh, did you get the press tickets for tomorrow's International Naval Conference in Westminster? Well, there aren't any for the conference proper. There'll be a public statement afterwards. Oh, Jenny. What do you think they're doing? Force of habit, I imagine. When you plan an offensive campaign, you'll tell the press as much as it's good for it to know later on. Oh, it's absolutely silly. More like Russia every day. 
Well, there must be someone I could talk to. Whatever the IP you think of will be out to lunch now. Hmm. I've got it. Dr. Maté. He'll be attending the Naval Conference. So? Darling, you've invited Dr. Maté to dine with us at your club tomorrow evening. I've never spoken to the gentleman. Don't worry. I'll telephone and fix it. Now, hmm. I think I'll order one of the cheese displays and then... I realize that the service makes its own rules, Mr. Watson. But as no pledges were required from the rest of us attending the conference, well, I choose to regard myself at liberty to discuss the proceedings. You heard the official pronouncement, of course. Has anything conclusive been turned up as to what caused big ships like the Queen Anne to sink so suddenly? Well, this is only a theory, but it seems plausible. Mm -hmm. The weapon used appears to be... Of a vibratory type and capable of setting up sympathetic vibrations of such intensity in the attack vessel that she literally shakes herself to pieces in a minute or two. Another weapon is assumed to be some contrivance which attacks the hull below the waterline. An instrument that is capable of slicing the bottom clean off a ship. Does Dr. Bocker go along with the weapon theory? Oh, he does indeed, Mrs. Watson. But even he could not suggest how such a device could be made to slice through the hull of a large ship with the efficiency of a wire through cheese. Well, what's the next move, Dr. Matty? Well, the important thing at the moment is to get across to the public that the danger is not incomprehensible and to stop this silly panicking. I gather your job is to help cool people off. So that's why I decided. Uh, well, gentlemen, as you know, at yesterday's session, a general agreement was reached uh, that a torpedo-like weapon uh, designed to give submerged escort to a vessel could profitably be developed to counter the assumed uh, mine form of attack. Uh, a motion was accordingly put uh, that all nations represented at this international naval conference should uh, pool information likely to help in the rapid development of such a weapon. However, an objection has been registered with the presiding council uh, by the technical committee from the USSR. The spokesman for the Russian delegation has been accorded time to address today's session on this point. Uh, please proceed, Mr. Andreev. On behalf of the peoples of the USSR, I must state frankly that I doubt whether if the West happen to possess a means of controlling a submerged missile by radio <coughs> signals not subject to electronic or other interference, they would care to share such knowledge with the Soviet people even at this time. Uh, Mr. Antraev, uh, since the Western Alliance called this conference for the purpose of uh, cooperation, I feel duty-bound to state that the West has indeed perfected such a means of control. Yes. If we can believe such a claim to be true, we will also be compelled to assume that it could only have come about through the theft of the work of Soviet scientists by capitalist pioneers. The delegation of the USSR is left with no alternative but to withdraw. Uh, the presiding council acknowledges that the Soviet delegation has exercised the privileges of withdrawal. Uh, <clears throat> As a follow-up to yesterday's report, uh, please note that experiments with counter-vibration... So, oh, while the deputy supervisor of the Naval Research Committee wouldn't permit any press people to attend the test of the counter-devices, Lieutenant Royd here was responsible for making a record of what happened. That's why I asked you and Phyllis to come over as quickly as you could. But Bill Royd and I were school chums, so whatever he tells you is off the record. Well, we, we have a sort of anti-vibration gadget that is a bit wearing at first. It sets up a constant hum which you can half feel, half hear. The other gimmick we tested is a tin fish you sling overboard. A dolphin, they're calling it. It promptly makes a way forward and then settles down to travel about 300 feet ahead of the ship at about five fathoms. Oh, it's under control, of course, but when it spots anything, it flashes a signal on a screen and goes for it automatically. Lieutenant, do you think the dolphins are likely to be successful counter-weapons? 
The combination of the anti-vibration gadget and the dolphin seems to do the trick all right. Of course, it'll cost a pretty penny to outfit all the ships afloat. Plus, the cost of replacing dolphins. There you go again, Mike. Hmm? What do you say? Falling asleep on the sofa with a lighted cigarette. I wasn't sleepy. I was just thinking. Well, if I wasn't here, you'd have set the place to fire. <sighs> Nearly time for the Prime Minister's statement to the nation. <sighs> if it's what I think it's going to be, that will put you to sleep. This is the English Broadcasting Company. The time is now 10.30. And we bring you an important message from the Prime Minister. Good evening. I know that many of you have been beset by anxiety about the unusual problems that we have had to contend with. Your government and the services have made valiant efforts to produce effective countermeasures. During the past six months, a progress in defensive gear has been such that tonight I can speak to you optimistically. My friends and fellow citizens, the battle of the deeps has been won. Our ships are able once more to ply upon their usual courses. But these menaces that have caused such grievous losses along our vital sea lanes, these menaces still remain, of course. We cannot afford, therefore, any slackening of effort in combating them. We must use all our capabilities to find out everything we can about this peril. Then we shall launch a mighty assault upon this pestilence, so that with its utter destruction, our ship shall be free to sail upon the high seas of the world. So I say to you, be of good spirit, Men of courage and determination have dedicated themselves. So, if you take all the aspects into account, that's how matters seem to shape up now, Dr. Barker. Mm. What I heard today was that the 11th ship had been sunk this week. There's been one more, huh? only an hour ago in the Caribbean. Mm. What do they have to say now about the operation of their defensive gear? Apparently, the dolphins operated successfully. But the anti-vibration gear, for some reason, failed to prevent the ship shaking to pieces under their feet. But that's not what we came to see you about. No? Yeah. Well, uh, how can I help you? It concerns an unusual report from April Island, south of the Sunda Strait in Indonesia. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, we'd like your opinion of it. Uh, far away, far away. Well, it seems that a small gunboat had set out to capture a band of smugglers reported hiding in a remote coastal village. Mm. A surprise approach was made at night, and an advanced landing party went ashore armed with automatic rifles and grenades. Mm. When firing broke out, followed by two loud explosions, the gunboat commander switched on his searchlight and moved in toward shore. No figures were visible among the huts. Mm. The only signs of the advanced landing party were several submachine guns lying on the sand, close to the water's edge. <clears throat> at daylight, the first officer and five armed men went ashore. The beach itself was scored in four places by broad furrows leading from the water's edge toward the huts. Furrows? Oh. The furrows were over eight feet wide and curved in section, as if a large boiler had been dragged across the foreshore. <laughs> the officer noted that the abandoned weapons, the ground, the huts of the village, and the surrounding trees all had a thin coating of slime which glistened oddly. Yeah. The ground about the huts also was littered with small metal fragments, most of them curved, all of them shiny with the slime. Mm. No one, alive or dead, was in the village, and the slime was beginning to stink in the hot sun. A photographs were taken of the furrows on the beach, and samples of the slime and metal fragments were collected. Good, good. And a the gunboat then made a landing in another bay on April Island. At first, the village appeared deserted. The gunboat's siren finally attracted half a dozen obviously terrified natives who'd been hiding up on a hill. But they refused to visit the gunboat, insisting that the sea wasn't safe. Mm -hmm. yes. Did they say why it wasn't safe? They claimed that several of the shore villages had been attacked. What by? They said the whales. Whales? 
That's as much as the first officer could make out. Whales and giant jellyfish. Well, fantastic, isn't it? Uh, Mike, show Dr. Brocker the sample of the metal fragment. Yes, yes, it's queer stuff, all right. It sounds like lead, yet it uh, weighs like feathers. Seems to be some unusual kind of alloy. What intrigues me is that smelly slime sprayed on everything. Mm, Yes, yes. It poses three questions. How? What? Why? Apparently something came out of the sea. Several things, in fact. Yes, quite heavy things. Judging by the broad furrows they made on the beach. Yes, well, it would seem that the slime might be some sort of weapon which is sprayed when the uh, uh, giant whale or jellyfish or <laughs> what sits out of deck. My impression is that somehow or other the gunboat sailors, along with the native villagers, were carried off by whatever it is that came out of the sea. Yes, yes, yes I'm inclined to agree. What's beginning to worry me now is that we can probably anticipate an increasing number of these raids. With unsuspecting people being dragged out of their beds and into the sea. Yes, I'm afraid so. Yes, this is a very serious development. Something must be done immediately before panic spreads. We shall have to act very quickly to avert a worldwide disaster. Battle of the Deeps has only just begun. I've got a job for you two. Something exciting. What's the pitch, Freddy? One of EBC's favorite sponsors proposes to send off an expedition to obtain definite evidence of the nature of the deep sea menace. Expedition? Where to? Well, that was our first question, Phyllis. But he doesn't know. The whole decision on location is in Dr. Bocker's hands. Bocker? His stock has recovered quite a bit because his pronouncements have had a higher score than anyone else's. So the sponsor went to Bocker and said, Look here. These things came up on April Island, Safira, and a few other out-of-the-way places. Where do you think they're most likely to appear next? Walker wouldn't tell him, of course. But they talked, and the upshot was that the sponsor will subsidize an expedition led by Bocker to a region to be selected by Bocker. What's more, Bocker also selects the personnel, and he specifically asked BBC to approve you two. He was always my favorite ographer. Well, when do we start? You'll travel by air for safety's sake. Now go and talk it over with Dr. Bocker, and then come back here and we're going to contract some more. You know, I can't help feeling guilty. For five weeks, we've done nothing but laze around the Grand Hotel and wait for something to happen. Well, probably nothing much has happened on the island of Escondida since the last pirate ship disappeared from the Spanish main. Oh, speaking of pirates, I discovered that the capital was called Smithtown after some fellow who'd been a pirate. Good heavens, I've never heard of a pirate named Smith. <laughs> but I haven't figured out why Bocker selected Escondida. Well, be thankful he did, Mike. We might be languishing on Grand Cayman or Little Cayman. There's one thing. If an attack does come here, we have enough floodlights rigged up to let us see and film everything. Hello, you two. Oh, hello, Muriel. You've been swimming again? We kept to the very shallow places. Oh. Would you care for a drink? I suppose there's time for a quick one before what? dinner. No, uh-huh. don't get up, Mike. I'll get it. Oh, gee, and tea for me, Leslie. Yeah. I suppose you've heard the news about Gallows Island in the Bahamas? Uh, no, we were having a siesta. Uh, Port Anne, the chief town on Gallows, was raided last night. And nearly half the population disappeared. Yes. Oh, thank you, Leslie. More than a thousand people in all. Mm, I'll bet Bucker's gnashing his teeth. No, he's very excited at the reports from survivors. At last, it seems we've something definite to go on. Well. Yes, there were plenty of people who agreed that well, they'd seen things like tanks. What sort of tanks? Like military tanks, but larger, that came sliding up the beaches. Uh, the reports are very confused after that. Panic, I suppose. Has the news reached Smithtown? Mm, it certainly has. People are organizing armed patrols. Mm, things are looking up. Well, I think I should have another tall, cool one before dinner. Mike's thirst for excitement is equaled only by his unquenchable thirst. Phil, it's time you stopped staring at the moon and came to bed. No soul, that's the trouble. I often wonder why I manage you. Darling, it's nearly one o'clock. What the devil is there to look at besides the empty town square? Listen. Hmm? 
you do? Mike. Mike, they must be coming. Uh, what? Look. Look, the floodlights are going on. Why? I can only see a few people running across the square towards the harbor. Well, the houses cut off our view beyond the square. Well, I better get down there. I must see what's no. going on. But, Phil, that's what we came here for. I don't care. We wait a bit. Please give me that door key. Don't be a fool, Mike. Stop. Now, why did you have to throw the key out of the window? Don't you see? The only reports we've had at all were from the people who hid or ran away. That's all very well, but... Look, look, there's Leslie running back. What is it, Les? Oh, no. I can't get through the crowd. They see it's coming this way, whatever it is. I'll film it from my window. People are all running now. Bocker's down on the patio with the pilot. Everybody stay inside the hotel. Keep all the floodlights on, Leslie, but keep on the cover. What's that noise? That's the sea tanks heading this way. My God, look. Huh? There's one of the tanks. I better get some commentary on tape. <clears throat> this is Michael Watson for EBC. From a second floor window of the Grand Hotel on the island of Escondida in the Caribbean, we've just had our first sight of a sea tank. A curve of dull gray metal has come sliding into the town square, carrying away the lower corner of a house front. Men with rifles are shooting at the lumbering sea tank, but the bullets appear to have no effect. Slowly, heavily it comes on, grinding and scraping across the cobblestones of the floodlit square for which people have fled in terror. The shooting's wild now. I estimate the sea tank's speed at under three miles an hour. Imagine an elongated egg about 35 feet long, which has been halved down its length and set flat side to the ground. There may be rollers beneath, but it seems and sounds simply to break forward on its metal belly with plenty of noise, but none of machinery. Another sea tank is now coming sight. Yes? Yes, it's heading in our direction. Now another. A third sea tank has stopped in the middle of the town square. The crowd is running away now. The nearest tank is bombing. So it is. All the sea tanks have stopped. And now, the nearest tank is... is bulging. What I mean is, on its smooth top, a small dome-like swelling has appeared. It's lighter colored than the metal beneath. A kind of off-white, semi-opaque substance that glistens under the floodlights. And it appears to be growing in size. Yes. It's growing rapidly, in fact. They're all doing it now. The bulges have appeared on all three tanks. It's no longer dome-shaped, but spherical, attached to the metal by a neck. Inflating like balloons, they sway slightly as they swell bigger and bigger. They're going to explode! Each tank now has more than one swelling. The largest is at least five feet in diameter. They look like repulsive bladders. Something's happening in the nearest tank. The largest balloon has just become detached. It, yes, yes, it's wobbling into the air like a huge soap bubble. It's up ten feet or so now. It's just hovering there. But, no, there it goes. It's not an explosion, really. There's no sound at all. It's just like a it's split open. And now, now, a great number of long tendrils like giant white whiplashes shooting out in all directions. Oh, Look out, Bill! Oh, help me! My arm is just up to my arm! Hold tight. My arm! They both let go. It's pulling me out of the window. Ah, there. It's let go. Oh, my arm. It's just a skip right off. You're all right. You're all right. What's happening out there now? All the tentacles are drawing back into the balloon. Oh, God. It's got Muriel oh, and Leslie, oh, too. People are being caught like flies and fly paper. What's that noise? Johnny's shooting up the sea tanks. One of them blew up. <laughs> Lie still, oh. darling. I'll get the doctor as soon as I can. The door's locked and I threw away the key. I'll break it open with a chair. <laughs> yeah, there's no doubt about it. Last night was hell on earth. Oh, how is your arm, Phyllis? Oh, it's throbbing, but I can manage. You know, you ought to stay in bed. <laughs> she refuses to miss a trick. Phew, the smell of that slime and everything is overpowering. Yes, indeed. Oh, Alfred, Bill, Muriel, Leslie, all gone. And 
my boat to Old Hair. I've shown very little consideration for your safety, I'm afraid. Oh, you mustn't feel personally responsible, Dr. Brocker. None of us had to come, you know. Yes. As we have some results, at any rate. Thanks to Ted's camera work, the people at home will now be able to see what we're up against. And thanks to him, too, we have the first specimen. Specimen? What of? Oh, a piece of one of those long tentacle things. One of them whipped through the window and Ted cut off about 18 inches of it. It just dropped to the floor, wriggled a couple of times and then curled up. We shipped it off in the planes with the films. Well, just what are they? There is there's something very peculiar about them. The, the fundamental is obvious enough. It goes back to some type of sea anemone, but whether the things have been bred or whether they have in some way been built up on the basic pattern, who knows? I find several points extremely disturbing. Their behavior implies specialized purpose. The things are used, you see. But not like weapons in the ordinary sense. Not, not just to destroy, that is it. They're more like snares. You mean the purpose is to catch and collect people like... Well, as if they were sort of shrimping for us. Yes. There is something of the kind. They seem to be invulnerable to rifle fire. Yes, but explosive cannon shell can fracture the metal casing. The, the manner in which it then disintegrates suggests that it's already under very strong stress and not very far from breaking point. Any idea what might be inside the sea tanks? Well, the contents seem to have been simply gelatinous masses confined under immense pressure. Yet there must be a mechanism of some kind to propel these immensely heavy hulls. Heavy is right, Doctor. I examined their trails this morning. Some of the cobblestones have been ground down and some cracked into flakes. Do you think they're a real threat? To our species, I mean. I don't know. There, there have been lords of the earth before us. Some of them in a sounder position, too. There was a great variety of dinosaur types which should have given them a broad chance of survival. All the human eggs, on the other hand, are pretty nearly in one basket. Unless we can discover precisely what is involved in this assault. Admiral Porter, and Mr. and Mrs. Watson are here for the interview. Ah, oh, yes, Winters. Uh, bring them in. Good of you to make yourselves available. We're happy to cooperate, Admiral. Please sit down. Admiral, I think that you've read Dr. Barker's latest report. Uh, yes, I have, Winters. Uh, it raises a large number of controversial points. In what respect, sir? Well, Dr. Bocker shows, if I may say so without offense, a generosity of hypothesis which appears to exceed the warrants of the observed facts to a degree quite remarkable in a reputable scientist. Some of the newspapers have had quite a go at Bocker, but calling him hysterical and so on. Mm, precisely, Winters. That's why I thought that a chat with the others who were present at the Escondida incident might... Uh, help to put things in perspective for us. <coughs> uh, now, Dr. Bocker says here in his report that these sea tank things and the exuded pseudo sea lenterata are unaffected by rifle fire, but that the sea tanks completely disintegrated when hit by explosive cannon shells. You support that? Yes, sir. They explode as thoroughly as a broken light bulb implodes. Giving no identifiable fragments? Just a lot of metal splinters and pieces which might have been anything. Except the slime? Oh, yes, except that, of course. By afternoon, the sun had baked that dry and it was like a hard varnish over everything. Hmm. Now, these tentacle things. Would you say that both these forms showed any degree of intelligence? <laughs> it's a very difficult one, sir. They responded to certain external stimuli and very strongly. There was intelligent direction of both forms, undoubtedly. Hmm. Dr. Bocker's theory is that these forms were, in fact, agents only. That is, that the controlling mind was elsewhere and directed them by some means of communication at present unknown to us. What's your opinion on that? I think the theory is tenable, sir. My wife compared the whole operation to something like shrimping. An indiscriminate instrument rather than a precise one? Yes, Admiral. It discriminates no further than to select the animate from the inanimate. Hmm. If I understand Dr. Bocker rightly, he suggests that the sea lenterates are probably not, in the accepted sense, living creatures at all. It appears to be his opinion that they may well be artificial organic constructions 
built for a specialized purpose. He, uh, uh, let me see now. How does he put it? Ah, yes. It is far from inconceivable that organic tissues might be constructed in a manner analogous to that used by chemists to produce plastics of a required molecular structure. If this were done, and the resulting artifact rendered sensitive to stimuli administered chemically or physically, it could, temporarily at least, produce a behavior which would, to an unprepared observer, be scarcely distinguishable from that of a living organism. How does that strike you, Captain Winters? Well, there is a certain logic in it, sir. As Barker suggests, the lenteret form could have been selected for its simplicity of construction. And likewise, the sea tank. In other words, then, we are being attacked by organic mechanisms under remote or predetermined control. Hmm. Well, possibly less startling than it appears, Admiral. But when it's considered in the light of the control which we ourselves are able to exercise over inorganic materials, remotely as with guided missiles, or predeterminately as with torpedoes. Good analogy, Winters. All the same, unsupported speculation of this kind will undoubtedly be played up by the newspapers. Uh, it's nice to see you back again down this way, Mr. Watson. What it'll be tonight? A pint of your excellent cider, Mr. Martin. Oh, well, there's still plenty of that, sir. Now, if it was whiskey you'd ask for, it'd be a different story. Feeling the pinch, are you? Everyone's feeling it. The bloody cost of living's up 200%. God knows when it'll stop. Ah, but they choke the ship because the crews refuse to work them. Or the owner won't pay the insurance rates. Not that I blame her, mind you. But it's putting thousands and thousands out of work. But the situation shouldn't get out of hand with the national airlift working. <laughs> Two large air freighters working on a rapid shuttle service can bring in nearly as much as the average cargo boat could carry the same length of time. But think of the cost, Mr. Watson. Meanwhile, those bloody sea tank things are having themselves a field day. At least a dozen places raided in the Caribbean in the past two weeks. There's a whole series of bloody attacks on the coast of Japan and elsewhere. Well, at least we're not likely to be attacked. The British Isles sit relatively high on the continental shelf, and at our backs we have the shallow North Sea. It's places where the really deep water that have to worry about raids. Uh, just as well, too. Otherwise, there'd be panics here, just like in the West Indies. This morning's paper reckons there must be thousands of these bloody sea tanks at work. And it's my opinion, sir, that the newspapers are only allowed to print part of the story. If all the facts were to be made public, it'd be such an outcry. They must provide defenses, Phil, or else give the people the means to defend themselves. Well, that would mean letting people have arms. Isn't it almost a principle that a people should not be allowed to defend itself, but should be forced to defend its government? What's wrong, darling? Nothing, except that it's... Well, at times I get sick of putting up with all the shams and humbugs and pretending that the lies aren't lies and the propaganda isn't propaganda. Oh, I'll get over it, but... Well, I think they're going to let thousands of people be killed by these horrible things rather than risk giving them powerful enough weapons to defend themselves. Oh, darling... Oh, I know what you're going to say, Mike, but I am scared. Nobody's really doing anything. They call conferences by the score and talk and talk and talk as if, well, it'll all come right in the end if only they can keep on talking long enough. But they are trying, you know. Are they? I could... Oh. I, I'm sorry, Mike. I, I shouldn't have gone off the handle like that. I, I must be tired or something. I know. It's been quite a strain. But there's nothing to be frightened about. You're not frightened? Oh, not really. Come on, let's walk down to the pub and have a nice fight for you. How does Mr. Martin manage to serve such good cheese nowadays? Black market, I expect. I'll be very sorry if he ever runs out of this cider. Well, good evening, Mrs. Watson. I haven't seen you here for a spell. I've been rather busy, Mr. Martin. Nasty business had an attack at Santander on the North Spanish coast last night. Yes. Cassidy reckon it's up to 3,200 now. And you know what? Our esteemed Prime Minister has a nerve to say that the government is actively watching the situation. He keeps saying no cause for alarm. There's thousands of these sea tanks are crawling all over the sea bottom. 
And it'll go on being no bloody cause for alarm until several hundred poor Englishmen somewhere has got their bloody selves lassoed by, by flying jellyfish. Then it'll be all emergency orders and bloody panic. You watch. Now, the whole thing boils down to the fact that we still know too little about... What's the idea, Freddy? It's the middle of the night. Grab your hat and recorder, Mike. There's a car on the way for you now. There'll be a plane waiting at Northolt. What's it all about? You mean you've not heard? Heard what? Sea tanks. Place in Ireland called Bunkara, Donegal. Ireland attack? You want an on-the-scene documentary piece, so pop over there like a good fellow and get down your impressions. Were there many casualties? Half the village population, unfortunately. Mm. Over 200. Yeah. There were six sea tanks. Prompt telephone call brought on two jet fighters. They wiped out three tanks, and the rest went sliding back into the water. Now they're expecting more raids in places like Galway Bay, so be on your toes. Okay, Freddy, I'll do my best. Once I get there, I'll telephone you. And according to the official report, it's the Irish who've taken almost the whole weight of the North European attack. So far, Scotland has suffered only a few minor sea tank visitations in the Outer Isles, with scarcely a casualty... England's only raids to date occurred in Cornwall, and they, too, were small affairs for the most part. In America, serious trouble has been confined to the Gulf of Mexico. In general, it's the West Indies, the East Indies, the Philippines, and Japan that continue to suffer most. But they, too, have been learning ways of inflicting enormous damage on the sea tanks for very small returns. And now, we turn the discussion over to our distinguished panel of experts with... Fred Whittier, Director of Talks and Special Features, acting as host and moderator. Mr. Whittier. Uh, good evening, and welcome to Round Table, an informal discussion of newsworthy topics. In the studio tonight, we have the eminent geographer, Dr. Alistair Bocker, John Mallaby, editor-at-large of The Tidings, Captain Robert Winters, Royal Navy, and Michael Watson, well-known writer and broadcaster who has covered many assignments for EBC in connection with the Battle of the Deeps. First, a few words from Mike Watson, who recently returned from a tour of Ireland. I'm glad to be able to say that the Irish are holding their own very nicely. After the first attack in Donegal, the government obtained large numbers of mines, bazookas and mortars. And then, all along the west and south coasts, squads of men quickly laid minefields above the tide lines, where there were no protecting cliffs. In coastal towns, pickets armed with bomb-firing weapons keep all night watch. Elsewhere, planes, jeeps, and armored cars wait on call. Oh, very encouraging, Mike. But their countermeasures have not deterred the sea tanks. <laughs> it's true, Fred, but they've certainly cost them their most potent weapon, surprise. And their losses very often are 100%. Now, I believe Dr. Bocker has a comment. Mm, yes, yes, yes. yes. I, I've had little success trying to persuade various authorities to include special traps among their defenses. Mm. Captain Winters, any comment on that aspect? Well, a few traps of the pitfall type were dug, but uh, none ever made a catch. Another factor is that uh, scarcely any place is willing to contemplate the prospect of a sea tank trapped on its foreshore, but still capable of throwing out tentacles for an unknown length of time. In any case, any attempt at broaching stalled or disabled sea tanks invariably cause them to explode in geysers of slack. Very often they do so before the attempt is made. That's the effect of exposure to bright sunlight. Uh, the, the point I wish to make is that without actual specimens for close examination... All the same, Dr. Bocker, those things down there have been taking a terrific beating, wouldn't you agree? A beating, Captain? We ourselves have a tradition of taking beatings and then winning wars. Just look at what we have had to endure. We've lost the freedom of the seas. We've been forced to depend on air transport for the very food by which we live. How much longer are the raids likely to continue? <clears throat> if we knew the precise reason for the raids, it might be easier to make some kind of a prediction. In any case, their instigators are now better informed about us and therefore potentially more dangerous. Why do you say more dangerous? Because if defeated, they are not likely to try again in the same way with the same weapons. It boils down to this. Two intelligent forms of life are finding one another's existence intolerable. I've now come to believe that no attempt at a rapprochement could possibly have succeeded. Life in all its forms is strife. 
The better match the opponents, the harder the struggle. The most powerful of all weapons is intelligence. Any intelligent form dominates by and therefore survives by its intelligence. A rival form of intelligence must, by its very existence, threaten to dominate and therefore threaten extinction. Any intelligent form is its own absolute, and there cannot be two absolutes. What do you propose we do? We must attack. Attack as swiftly as we can find the means and with the intention of complete extermination. For the moment, we're pushing these things back, but they will return. For the same urge drives them and drives us. The necessity to exterminate or be exterminated. And when they come again, they will come better equipped. Are you serious about their trying new and perhaps deadlier weapons? Consider their alternatives, Mike. If they decide to give up on the sea tank assault, either they sit down there in the deeps waiting for us to find a means to destroy them, or they come after us. I predict that unless we find a means to exterminate them very soon, they will be launching an entirely new kind of assault on us. From what I've seen of their capabilities, we could easily be the losers. By we, I mean mankind. Every human being on this earth. Rain the garden is rather chilly this summer, Mrs. Watson. I thought it would be better if we met inside. <laughs> It's more than chilly, Dr. Maté. It's cold. It's nice to have this fire. Mm -hmm. Well, partly the result of the shipping problem, Mr. Watson. It has resulted in such a reduced demand for steel that we have now a surplus of coal. Now, take a look at this large map with the colored pins. Uh, the blue ones represent fog concentrations. The red pins are for... Icebergs. It does tie in with what Captain Winters told us about the uh, unusual amounts of broken ice in Davis Strait. And the sea north of Baffin Bay is crammed with icebergs. Captain Winters said that you'd been on an aerial tour of that area, Dr. Maté. Yes, I was. You see this high Greenland ice cap? The glaciers that run down from it are carving. I have seen icebergs form before, but... Never on anything like the scale it is taking place there. The great ice cliffs, hundreds of feet high, are crumbling at an unusual rate and, and creating countless bergs as big as small islands. And judging by the red pins on your map, it's happening elsewhere, too. Indeed it is. Everywhere in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, too. What do you make of it? Well, for one thing, the unusual ice conditions readily account for the dense fog off Newfoundland. Elsewhere, I, I ascribe the fox to deep-running cold currents forced upwards into the warm water above by encounters with submarine mountains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see such a gloomy summer, Phyllis? Oh, it's dreadful. Harold said I must be off my rocker to want to spend a weekend at your cottage in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. But I said any place is better than London in such depressing weather. Well, at least the winds along the coast shift the fogs occasionally. Do you know, last weekend we had sun for four hours. Mm. Oh, it was glorious. And of course, it, it does mean traveling by train now that petrol's rationed. Although Mike does rate a priority card from EBC. Oh, isn't he doing a series on icebergs? Um, on climate and how it affects our way of life. Oh, yes. Well, as Harold says, it's very clever of the scientists to know so much about icebergs and fogs and so on. But it doesn't seem to be much good knowing if they can't do something about it. Well, what exasperates me is that they don't stop from doing it. Well, Tune, stopping icebergs is probably pretty difficult. No, no, I, I, I mean stopping the Russians from making icebergs. Oh, dear. Tune, do you still think it's the Russians? Is that you, Mike? Yes, Phil. Wait till you see tonight's paper. Why? Well, what's happened? Old Buck has done it again. He stuck his neck out a mile. They were interviewing him about the icebergs and the fogs, and he let fly. Do tell. Now, listen to what Bocker told a fellow from the Evening Herald. 
The Arctic and Antarctic ice caps have been scattering their icebergs into the seas since before there were men to know of it. But why, in this year, should they suddenly spawn 10, 20 times as many icebergs? There must be a reason for this. There is. Mm, Tuny claims it's the Russians. <laughs> She's a scatterbrain. Uh, Dr. Bocker also said, if some means of melting the Arctic ice were put into operation, a little time would have to pass before its effects became noticeable. Moreover, the effects would be progressive. First a trickle, then a gush, then a torrent. I have seen estimates which suggest that if the polar ice were melted, the sea level would rise by 100 feet. That is no more than a round figure guess. Are, are you following, down? Yes. Yeah. Oh, boy, the old man certainly has a lot of nerve. Just imagine the uproar this latest theory will trigger. Yes, and that's not all. Bucker also said, in this connection, I draw attention to the fact that in January of this year, the mean sea level at Newland, where it is customarily measured, was reported to have risen by two and a half inches. Oh, dear. Of all the pertinacious stickers out of necks. We'd better go and have a chat with him, if he hasn't already done it. You can see by the pile of mail that it hasn't gone unnoticed. You'll probably be contaminated if you associate with me. In most countries, I'd be under arrest by now. Dr. Bucker, do you really like to have people throwing things at you? I get impatient, Mike. And one day you'll get hurt. Now, to ordinary people, two and a half inches is just a very slightly higher mark on a post. But after your build-up, it sounded so tiddly that everyone feels annoyed with you for alarming them. Quite a lot of people have been alarmed, or at least indignant. And that was what I wanted. You know well enough how it has been since the beginning of this business. At every stage, the great majority, and particularly the authorities, have resisted the evidence as long as they could. Very reluctantly, the existence of something in the deeps was belatedly conceded. Now here we are again, balking at the newest hurdle. What about the Americans? Uh, same attitude. If anything, a bit more so. Business is their national sport, and like most national sports, semi-sacred. A still bigger slump than they've been having since the shipping troubles started wouldn't help anyone. So we all watched and waited. We? And a number of people have been well aware of what must be going on, though not, of course, how it's being done. But for one reason or another, not excluding government pressure, they've been keeping quiet about it. And now you've decided to force the government's hand. Mm, yes, yes. But, but not alone. This time I have the company of a number of eminent and very worried men. Mine was only the opening shot on this side of the Atlantic. As for the American end, just take a peek at Life magazine and look next week. Well, what can be done? That is strictly between ourselves. The only possible thing that I can see for them to do is to organize salvage. To make sure that certain things and people are not lost. The rest will have to take their chances. Melting the Arctic seems a pretty formidable proposition. So do you have a theory on how it's being done? Well, we know that they have some kind of device that will project a jet of water with considerable force. The bottom sediment that was washed up into surface currents during their submarine mining operations pretty well proved that. Well, a contraption like that, used in conjunction with a heater, say uh, an atomic reaction pile, ought to be capable of generating a quite considerable warm current. But do they have atomic fission? Yeah, we don't know. So far, there's been no indication that they have, and unless you count our presenting them with at least one atomic bomb that didn't go off. And the iceberg angle? That's less difficult. It's pretty general agreement that if one has a vibratory type of weapon that can cause a large ship to fall to pieces, there ought to be no difficulty in causing even a huge lump of ice to crack. And nobody knows of anything we can do. It boils down to this, Phyllis. We simply don't think the same way as our enemy. Practically all of our strategy of defense or attack is based on our ability to deliver or resist missiles of one kind or another. Whereas they don't seem to be interested in missiles. One, two, three, four. How do you read me now, Bert? Good. Yes, standing by. Yes, I'm on the roof of an EBC van parked on Vauxhall Bridge. Yeah, yes, ready when you are. Okay, here goes. This is Michael Watson reporting for the English Broadcasting Company from Westminster. 
From our vantage point on Vauxhall Bridge, we have an excellent view of the scene. The spring tides will reach their peak any moment now. In London, the riverside walls have been reinforced and topped for their whole length with sandbags. Cars and buses are still running on the bridge, but as a precaution, traffic has been diverted from the embankment. However, the curious crowds have turned out to throng it and the bridges. The police have done their best to keep them moving, but in spite of the steady drizzle, people dawdle from one point to another watching the slow rise of the water. The water is now lapping above the parapet and against the sandbags. Here and there, it's beginning to trickle through onto the pavements. Those whistles are signals for firemen, civil defense, and police to rush sandbags to reinforce wherever the trickle enlarges. The pace is getting hotter by the second now. Spectators are helping, dashing from one point to another as new leaks start up in the dikes. The warning signals are being given. There's no doubt what's going to happen, and people are withdrawing. Any moment now... Yes, there she goes. The breakthrough has happened. On the north bank, in a dozen places at once, gaps several yards wide have appeared through which muddy water is pouring. From where we are on Vauxhall Bridge, we're able to see three separate rivers pouring into the streets of Westminster, filling basements and cellars. Stand by, please. I've just been handed a note. The Victoria Embankment is flooded. On the south bank, the water is breaking into the streets of Lambeth, Southwark, and Bermondsey. Downriver Limehouse is getting it badly. There seems to be little that can be done now but wait for the tide to drop and then rush the repairs against its next rise. But you can be sure there will be plenty of damage claims resulting from this. requisitioned all the available earth-moving machinery. Yes, yeah, there's quite, quite a piece of organization seeing that every seaborne community and low-lying area is clamoring for them simultaneously. Mm, it's done something for morale, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. People are out in the thousands today to watch the concrete blocks going up on both banks. Yes, I wonder how high they'll go before the futility comes home to them. However, I suppose that from a propaganda point of view, some kind of show of activity is necessary. Of course, all over the world, the threat's the same. Low-lying places like Florida and Louisiana have resigned themselves to disappearing completely from the new maps. Fortunately, people don't seem to be panicking. Yes, not yet. But hadn't you noticed? Those with the wisdom and the means have already started moving out and up. Well, the EBC decided that, as a matter of policy, an emergency broadcasting unit would be maintained here. Yeah. Hmm. Did you volunteer? <laughs> Yes, Mike and I voted to stick around and see what happens. Mm -hmm. well, I hope the ABC picked some high-level spot. Well, they've leased the top two floors of a large department store near Marble Arch. Mm -hmm. About 75 feet above sea level. I should have thought that somewhere higher, like Hampstead or Highgate, would have been better. Neither of them is quite London. Well, things probably won't be too bad for a while. The real trouble will come with the next spring tides. By that time, let's hope enough people have had the sense to do a bit of it. Wrong. We've decided it was high time you left your flat and took up residence in our EBC emergency fortress. But can anybody sleep with all that clutter? Well, don't worry, Phyllis. The living quarters on the floor above are quite soundproof. Uh, come into my office for a bit. Freddy, there are still some things I'm not quite clear about. Now let's review the current situation. Tomorrow I have to fly up to Harrogate. Now, according to this confidential memo, the government's orderly scheme of evacuation was proved to be just the opposite. That's not surprising, really. With more than two-thirds of the country's population anxious to move on to higher ground, they didn't have a hope of checking the pressure. Mm, but bad as it is here, it's still worse elsewhere. Loss of life has been small, because there's been plenty of warnings. But the authorities are concerned about the growing tension in the higher areas. Those already in possession have organized themselves to prevent their being swamped by the two converging streams of refugees from the east and from London. Yes, I interviewed some refugees only a few days ago, and, and they said that as they approached Hampstead and Highgate, they began to encounter barricades in the streets and, and then weapons. And districts that are not flooded yet are beginning to catch the panic. Fortunately, the police are continuing to patrol 
well, there's at least a semblance of law and order. Yes, but for how long do you think? Now, let's face it, Freddie. There's a growing sense of breakdown. Nevertheless, our job as broadcasters is to help the government to restore a degree of order before things get completely out of hand. <laughs> now I understand why Parliament moves so quickly to Yorkshire. Harrogate's a comfortable 700 feet above normal sea level. One thing I'd like to get clear is the role EBC is supposed to play, at least as far as this London outpost is concerned. The idea is that we here are to preserve, as far as possible, the impression of business as usual. From the look of things here, all the reserves of diesel oil and petrol and food, we should be able to hang on for quite a time. And that's what everyone's hoping for, because headquarters is anxious to take the pulse of events wherever they happen. I wonder what Nelson would think of the view his statue is getting now. Northumberland Avenue, partly submerged. Seagulls perched on the column instead of pigeons. Whatever became of all the pigeons in Trafalgar Square? It looks more like Venice than London. And as for the pigeons, I expect they've all been trapped and eaten. At least things aren't as bad as they were several months ago. Now that the gangs have gone, we can wander about in safety again. Then why are you carrying that gun? habit, I suppose. Oh, dear, for me, it wasn't so bitterly cold. Here it is midsummer, and it feels more like midwinter. Were you surprised when Freddie and Alice pulled out? Oh, not surprised so much as disappointed. After all, when we started the special unit over a year ago, he was the one who pushed the business as usual idea. Well, I know that Alice has become very depressed with the state of things. And I can't say I blame her. Cheer up, darling. If it will make you feel any better, I'll apply for a transfer, too. And by the time it comes through, the water level shouldn't rise more than another eight or nine feet. I'll give Freddie a call and get the lay of things up there. What is it, Mike? Freddie was right when he warned us to stay put here. Look at this message we're to radiate. A call to all loyal citizens to support their legally elected government against any attempts that might be made to overthrow it by force. Mm, but such an attempt is already being made. It ties in with what Bert picked up on the Marine Band. About armed groups trying to break into the Harrogate administration area. Yes, it could. Oh, the strangest thing is the complete silence on the BBC wavelength. Yes, you know, that's hard to account for. Even if the headquarters of both broadcasting systems in Yorkshire have been overrun, there should be emergency units like us still on the air independently in Scotland and Northern Ireland. Mike, all we know of what's been happening beyond this immediate area is what the people at headquarters have chosen to let us know. Freddie well, wouldn't have spoken the way he did if things were not much worse there than they are here. Oh, Mike, I... I don't think I can stand this desolation much longer. But where is there to go if we could go? Well... There's the cottage. Oh, it wouldn't be so bad there in the country. There'd be things growing and not, not everything dying like this. There's no hope here. But even if we could make it to Cornwall, we'd need food and fuel. Well, there's plenty of tin stuff here. But we could take enough to keep us going until we could grow things. And, and there'd be fish and, and plenty of driftwood for fuel. But to stay here just to be drowned or starved and forced into destroying one another to live. All right, darling, we'll go. We're liable to get ourselves shot at. Trespassers in any district are given ruthless treatment nowadays. The trip by road used to be 268.8 miles. Yes, but our chances would be better traveling by water. And we'll need a boat large enough to carry supplies to keep us going. It would be suicide to try scrounging along the way. Don't forget, guns and ammunition. We can travel by night and hide out there. What's holding this up? I don't want to use the torch. It's a net right across the street. Well, hang on, I'll cut a hole for the boat to get through. Step back the way I came from, son. We only want to go through to get home to Cornwall. Cornwall? It's impossible. Let's get back and get stuck. Okay, we'll get back. I'm not sure. It's difficult to identify anything from the map. 
don't like to admit it, but it does begin to look as if Cornwall may be impossible. There's no future in our going back to London. It's bound to get worse all the time, and sooner or later we should have to get out of it somehow. This is just a desert of bricks and stones. In the country, you do have a chance. Well, have you thought about what we'll do if we get to the cottage only to find someone occupying it? Well, it took a month to get here, but we made it. Thank God no one's in the place. Obviously, a number of people have made use of it, judging by the mess. Mm. Everything's gone from the kitchen down to the last packet of pepper and the candles. Well, let's check the cellar. took the drum of oil and all the coal. But not the food. Food? I didn't want to tell you about it until I knew. Oh, it would have been too bitterly disappointing if it had gone. What food? Well, while you were in Ireland, I walled off that end of the cellar with bricks. There's a place nearly three feet by 18 filled with non-perishables. That was ages ago, before the flooding even began. I know, but not before they began sinking ships so fast it, well, it seemed to me it would be a good thing to lay in stores, just in case. Why didn't you tell me? Well, I, I knew you'd just get stuffy about it. Stuffy? Well, there are some people who seem to think it's more ethical to pay black market prices than to take sensible precautions. <laughs> did you break it up yourself? <laughs> yes, I did. Well, I, I didn't want anybody local to know, and... Oh, that's why my hands were such a mess for the time. Do you remember? Ah, yes. You yes. thought it was the gardening. Yes, well, it certainly puts us in a much better position. We can eat now for a long time if we ration ourselves. Well, let's get busy now and tidy the place up so that we can settle in before dark. Well, oh, I hope that does the trick. Those iron nails rust through very quickly, but they're all I can find. Oh, do you really think this old boat will hold together at sea? We'll just have to chance it, Phil. We might last out here another winter, but it would leave us virtually without provisions. Unless fit to face a journey, that will have to be made sometime. The cold I can't stand. Even the sea itself freezes well out from the shore. I'll rig the mast tomorrow so that we can continue to sail southeast when the fuel tank runs dry. At least we can try to find a place where it might be possible to grow things. <laughs> Perhaps we'll find only bullets wherever we try to land. Even that will be better than slow starvation and bitter cold. It's a gamble, of course, but we've no alternative. And now I'd better get the valve timing right on this wheezy old engine. If you'll just turn the flywheel... Mike, get the car. What? There's someone coming. Oh, there. Is your name Watson? Yes. Ah, good. Got a message for you. Michael and Phyllis Watson... Used to be on EBC. That's right. They've been putting your name out on the wireless. Who? Who has? Council for Reconstruction, they call themselves. They've been putting out a broadcast every night for a week now. Every time they end up a list of people they're trying to find. Your names were among them last night. Believed to be in the neighborhood of Penn Lynn, Cornwall. <laughs> I remembered seeing you at the pub in the old days. So I reckoned you'd better know about it. But... But who are they? What do they want? Some party that's trying to straighten this lot out a bit. Good luck to them, I say, wherever they are. It's more than tame somebody did. But what is it about us? What do they want? They just said they want you in London, if you can make it safely. If you can't, you're to stand by for further instructions later on. They give lists of people that they want to go to London or Sheffield and other places. <laughs> oh, come on. There's a bottle up at the cottage that I've been keeping in case of something special. <laughs> I haven't had a drink since I found a bottle of rum on the beach last year. Can you tell us any more, Mr. Turner? All right. Remember that scientist fellow, Bocker? But I thought he was as, as right as rain. Oh. They had him on talking a couple of nights ago, giving a general survey of the position. Well, the main things are that the water's finished raising. Much of the best land's gone, but all the same, Dr. Bocker reckons that if we get organized, we ought to be able to grow enough because they estimate the population's down to between a fifth and an eighth of what it was. Oh, Bocker. 
doctor said was that a lot of jelly stuff came up and went bad quickly in the sunlight. No shape to it. Not the pressure to hold things together, see? So what the what's it look like when they're down on the bottom of the sea is still anybody's guess. What they look like when they're dead is good enough for me. Let's drink to empty deeps and free seas again. It's going to be a very strange sort of world with only a fifth or an eighth of us left. There were only five million or so of us in the first Elizabeth's time. But we counted. You know, Mike, I was thinking, nothing is really new, is it? Once upon a time, there was a, a great plain covered with forests and full of wild animals. <laughs> I expect our ancestors hunted there. And then, one day, the water came in and drowned it all. And there was the North Sea. I think we've been here before, Mike. And we got through last time. As soon as we get the boat ready, we'll head north again. We've just about enough fuel to take us to London. Yes. Yes, let's go as soon as we can. 